Welcome everybody to this issue of uh, this session of AJOT Authors and Issues. My name is Stacy Reynolds. I am the editor in chief of AJOT. And here on Authors and Issues, what we like to do is talk to researchers about their work and to help bridge the gap between research and practice. So with me today is Dr. Lennon Graho from Washington University in St. Louis. He is an associate editor for the American Journal of Occupational Therapy. And he will co-host today along with Isaiah Wills, who is the AJOT student representative, uh, also a student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And our guests today are Kalia Johnson and uh, Ryan LaValley. Um, and they are both at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And they are authors on an, auth an issue is article that has just been published in AJOT. And the title of that article is Linking Anti-Racist Action from the Classroom to Practice. So Leah and Ryan, thank you both for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have you. And I thought maybe you could just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and where you are Zooming in from. Uh, sure. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm super excited to chat with you all about um, the manuscript. Um, I am Zooming in from Durham. North Carolina. Um, I've been at UNC um, as an assistant professor for four years now, been an occupational therapy practitioner going on 17 years, uh, working primarily um, with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Yeah, and I'm uh, Ryan and um, I'm a community practitioner and assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is where I'm zooming in from. Also the unceded territory of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation um, here in North Carolina. Um, I'm a Hillsboro resident, um, but um, zooming in from campus right now um, to have better Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so the paper that we're going to be discussing, I, I read as a really a call to action for educators to start implementing anti-racist practices within academic and fieldwork education. So I like to start our discussion just by get every, getting everyone on the same page with what terms mean. So I was wondering if you could start by defining what anti-racism and anti-racist action means within the context of this paper and what it means within the context of the work that you do. Yeah, sure. Um... I really think in, in the simplest terms, right, that anti-racism really is about the deliberate or intentional actions we take to, to build and maintain equity, particularly for racially minoritized groups. You know, when we talk about anti-racism, this is, you know, oppression and discrimination based on, on people's racialized group memberships. So speaking specifically about racialized groups. Um, and when it comes to our work as occupational therapy practitioners, um, I really think it's, we, we need to think about it in terms of the intentional ways that we counter and dismantle systems that impede how we are providing culturally affirming care. Um, and I know that sounds super big and grandiose because we were talking about systems, right? So understanding how this plays out in our system of healthcare broadly, but also what is happening in our systems of care locally and in our community. So right down to where it is we're working, how we're maintaining equitable spaces for um, our clients of, of racially minoritized backgrounds. And I'll just add something very small because that was very well said, um, that I think there's this step at the very beginning of anti-racism of identifying racism. We have to understand where racism is and how it exists in our systems. Um, and recognizing it is something that often, particularly white people are very bad at. And so that is especially important for us to be really thinking about how we recognize and, and the processes and, and habits that we build to really identify it within our own lives and the systems that we're functioning in as a first step before we can really even take that anti-action um, of racism because we have to understand it first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, um, Kalia and Ryan. First, thank you for creating such important work. I think this is very important work, and we started using this paper in our program as well. You mentioned in this paper that these anti-racist principles or practices 
conversations and activities can be uncomfortable, particularly because it requires educators to be vulnerable, to interrogate and reflect on their own sort of positionality. And, you know, I've done many activities with educators, social identity wheel, talking about brave, opening brave and safe spaces. And oftentimes the feedback is that it requires sort of a vulnerability from them that is often uncomfortable. So can you talk a little bit about this discomfort? Is it good or is it a good thing or a bad thing? And how do we make educators be comfortable with this vulnerability and discomfort? Uh, I could start, I think, um, in the sense that, I, I don't know, I, I think that we first have to shift our um, our understanding of discomfort as always negative. Um, I think discomfort shows growth. Um, you know, you can't change unless you are growing and changing, and that often includes discomfort. Um, but it, I, I won't call it pain <laughs> necessarily, but discomfort is very much there. And so, to as we're children in, in any part of our, our development of any aspect of our bodies and of our minds and of the ways that we move through the world, we have to feel uncomfortable so that we can understand the ways that we need to change and adapt and and create a better relationship with our environment and, and how we move through. I think we know that well as as therapists and therapy practitioners. Um, and so to step into that process willingly is sometimes afraid because you it's, I think, oftentimes less of a fear of discomfort and it's a fear of being wrong. It's a fear of having been wrong for a very long time. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's where people often stumble and, and are hesitant about stepping into these conversations because at least from an American US perspective, we've not built our skills very much in saying that we're wrong and owning our wrongness so that we can grow. Um, and so I think that really is the first step often in, in getting okay with the discomfort is not seeing it as discomfort, but just seeing it as an opportunity for us to grow and be humble um, and to say, I don't know, or I was wrong. <laughs> um, and I think that's it. We tell that to our students. We tell that to our, our fieldwork students as they're trying to figure out how to be practitioners. So um, it's very similar to these conversations as well. It's just particularly white people, we have been in such a space and such a system where we haven't had to feel that discomfort because the systems are not made to make us uncomfortable, quite the opposite, that this is like a ooh, new feeling for us and now it's hard for us to step into it. Um, you know, and so I, I think it's also a question that is very oriented towards um, at least, you know, white people from a majority perspective, um, because this is conversations that people are always having, people of color, indigenous people, um, you know, because they're forced to have those conversations to their own benefit and to, to their own advocacy needs. So it's it's part of everyday life for them in a lot of ways. The discomfort is something new for us. Um, and not to say that there aren't uncomfortable conversations that that BIPOC people have to have as well within their own communities. Um, but for us, it's, it's a different experience. Um, kind of jumping off of that, um, you know, being a student, I'm, I'm really curious about um, the discomfort on, a part, on the part of students. Um, do you think that there are um, some students who really embrace this, um, these like uncomfortable experiences um, or discussions and others that um, are very uncomfortable with it? And then additionally, um, what can educators do to create a safe uh, environment while still um, bringing up these, um, these potentially difficult topics? Um, and what can students do to support each other? Yeah, and no, I really appreciate that, that question. Um, thank you. I think, um, you know, speaking as a geriatric millennial, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, I think students are really hungry to talk about uh, this topic, you know, in, in our classrooms at UNC, like I have just not run into a situation where it's like, no, we don't want to talk about this. You know, it is very much on the, uh, on the forefront of students' minds. You know, we're already sort of bombarded with it as a society. It is in the news, it is on our social media, it is in our printed media. Um, it's like, you cannot go a day without confronting um, 
something that is in the realm of anti-racism or aligned to it in some way. And so I think students are really conscious about how they are socialized both inside and outside of the classroom and, you know, really not wanting to perpetuate any racism um, amongst each other, but definitely not in practice. And so, um, you know, that has been one of the motivators for Ryan and I, even in our own work, that students are asking to have these conversations. Um, and for those students who may not feel ready to talk about that in a very public space, um, we definitely open our offices up um, to them to, to debrief and just think out loud about these things. And, you know, really just as an educator, making sure we're intentional about creating space that allows um, not just for the, the conversation around sort of the, the uh, I won't say the like positive of, of anti-racism, but even if there's sort of dissension in that conversation as well, so that people who are struggling with it, or even the students who think, you know, racism doesn't exist because that we do have students who think that as well, that they can voice those opinions and we have those, those conversations. Uh, and I think what educators can do is just sort of model, model that, you know, if you, there are moments where, you know, we have discomfort because I, I certainly have it as well, especially when students say racism doesn't exist. And I'm like, can we stop saying that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, being able to, to really be vulnerable myself and talk about some of the things that are coming up for me as we're having these conversations. Um, students appreciate that. It makes us real. Um, it makes the, the conversations that much more real. It doesn't seem so right, robotic, like, oh, well, it's the thing we got to talk about and check the box, you know. And as far as what students do for each other, uh, I know y'all love a group me <laughs> <laughs> and, and meetups and things like that. And just, you know, being gentle with each other and recognizing that, you know, we, we all have learned particular habits and ways of being and doing. And we're also unlearning a lot of those habits and, and ways of being and doing and that as we as we learn better we do better and just giving each other time and grace to be able to to do that and I would just add that I think that there's something really important about that modeling statement that you you just said um Kalia because I think for example historically Kalia and I when we've taught about race and racism we've taught together um, and so we've modeled sort of someone who's attempting to be as much of a white ally as I can be and somebody who has that lived experience working together in the classroom, in that conversation, bouncing off of each other, sort of challenging each other if need be. Um, if I say something, Kalia will definitely call me out, you know, and, and those sorts of things. So I think that that's one thing that we, we have to let go of the supremacy of the professor. Um, and really recognize that we are just as much learners in the classroom as these students. And when we join them in that learning, it makes it much more comfortable for everybody across the board. Um, and so I think our, our modeling has been something that's really been really powerful to me. Um, and students have really valued having both of those voices in the classroom. And then it also allows us to respond to students in different ways things that maybe a white student needs a white person to respond to them, I'm there to do that and vice versa. So I think that that's, that's something that we often forget is that we're not alone, we have colleagues, um, but also that we can be use that vulnerability as a tool for, for teaching and modeling, um, as Kalia was saying. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's really important to um, acknowledge, yeah, that the vulnerability and then also, you know, the stage at, you know, where, especially coming from a student, um, some people are more ready to talk about it, some people are less ready to talk about it, and just trying, kind of finding that, um, you know, middle ground, a way for them to, to start to talk about it. I think that's very important. So. Can I just, I'll add one more thing, sorry. Um, I just had another thought in the sense that, you know, I think we often teach anti-racism towards white students. Um, and I think that we have to think about spaces for non-white experiences of racism to talk through anti-racism. Um, and so really make, cause then it, you can create a lot of discomfort for BIPOC students by just having the conversation yeah. really oriented towards the white experience of anti-racism. Um, and so us having skills as facilitators and educators to hold different spaces even, um, or hold different conversations or facilitate different parts of conversations 
where we just explicitly recognize this is a conversation for this experience. This is a conversation for that experience. It takes guts because we're not told to separate people by racial experiences very often. Um, but at the same time, we have to recognize that you can't build a whole class around the white experience of anti-racism and still meet the needs of the BIPOC students within that class in their work of anti-racism and the support that they might need. So challenging the literature that you're bringing in. Is it literature that's oriented towards like white fragility written, written for white people, you know? And so that's not a book a lot of people of color are gonna really benefit from reading. And so is that the type of literature that we're bringing in or are we really thinking from a diverse perspective and how we're teaching this content and enacting it within the classroom? Yeah, that's fabulous. I mean, my head's already going like, Really great conversation. I, I hate to shift gears, but I, I want to touch on something that I think you guys really hit home in the article, which is the idea um, that fieldwork educators need to be appraised of these principles and practices that students are learning. And, and if I were to take that uh, a step further, that fieldwork educators themselves should be actively engaging in, in critical self-reflection and cultural humility and, and ongoing education. And when I when I read that and I started thinking about that, I thought, wow, that is a to some extent a really big ask because what I hear, and I am not a fieldwork educator, but you know, I just hear that fieldwork educators are, you know, they feel overburdened, they feel overworked. We're having a really, you know, fieldwork uh, coordinators are having a hard time getting fieldwork sites. And I started thinking like, okay, if we are asking more of them, um, how do we do that? And how do we implement in it, that in a way that we aren't asking too much or burning them out? And I really took it a step further. And I said, you know, do we give up a field work site if the staff there isn't willing to commit to anti-racist practices and to support students in a way that that we are trying to do so in educational programs. So I don't really know where the question is in that, but I just wondered if you could talk to that, that conflict or that idea of like, we want, we need fieldwork sites, but we also need people who are supportive of, of these best practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that is a really interesting question. And I, I'd like to reframe it a little bit, you know, cause we are talking about anti-racism as something in addition to, you know, what we're asking of field work educators, but we really should think about it in, in terms of how we're changing the culture of occupational therapy practice. So not sort of like one more thing that people or field work educators need to sort of put on their list of roles and responsibilities, but this is really about a, the, the way the practice should be. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't see it necessarily as asking people to do something extra. Um, it may, the, I guess the extra in it, right, is that it might require some additional mental energy on their part because they may not have been, their thinking isn't oriented in that way. But I think if we're really going to um, make the sort of changes that we, we say we would like to see in occupational therapy, these are the kinds of things that it's going to have to take, you know, whether it's our, uh, the, the sponsoring universities, I'm not even sure, like, what the languages we use for that right now, but when schools ask fieldwork sites to to take students at those universities, when they provide you know education and, and trainings and things for fieldwork educators, that that is part of it. Um, that when states um, in their ethics mandates, you know, like anti racism being a part of that, um, we could even go a step further and talk about a coat in the curriculum and understanding that anti racism has to be a part of it so that we're not thinking about it as this extra thing that we have to do and that it is just like that is inherent in occupational therapy practice that we are coming from an anti racist lens. And to your question about whether or not we pull, you know, uh, uh, I guess cancel a contract with a field work site or something if they can't com commit to being anti-racist. I'd say absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because if not, I mean, we, we are essentially in endorsing then, right, that, that, our, that our students learn a particular uh, way of doing occupational therapy that can be violent for uh, people from minoritized backgrounds. And I know I certainly don't, don't want to sign off on that. 
inadvertently or not. Um, and I know probably people <laughs> in universes hearing that they're, they're going to cringe when I say that, but you know, it's, you, you gotta, you gotta take a stand somewhere. Right. And if a facility can't commit to, uh, being anti-racist, then, you know, what message are we sending by, by putting our students there? I think it also speaks to the need to advocate at the institutional level, um, you know, and, and not just put all of the burden, you know, of this work on the fieldwork educators, um, you know, particularly if there are fieldwork educators of color, then they probably already need a lot of institutional support um, to address some of the systemic issues that they're probably already fighting against within the ways that they're having to practice in those systems. Um, and so I see it as a, as a professional role of both our professional organizations and um, our universities to support those fieldwork educators in doing that systemic advocacy and essentially giving, I mean, the student is there to help with that, <laughs> um, you know, so helping them see it as a team where they can then take on some of that systemic change that needs to happen. Um, you, you get a student to help you <laughs> um, to, to support that work as much as you can. And then recognizing the, the specific things of engaging with that student through an anti-racist, I agree with Kalia in that it's, it's part of the continuing education of being a therapist that you should have those skills for your clients. And, and so you should also have them for students. Yeah, thank you for that. I, um, you know, I, I, I had this experience where I heard secondhand um, about a student who had been on fieldwork at this very well-established site and their fieldwork educator had kind of been, been as soon as they disclosed that they were gay, um, and I know we're talking about racism, but the student disclosed that they were gay. And then for the rest of the field work, um, their educator talked to them about conversion therapy and they never talked to, you know, and this was a repeated sort of thing. And, um, and, and the, they never disclosed this to anybody, but I just thought, you know, this is a site we send students to on a regular basis. And, and it's unsafe. Like you, you said, violent, you know, it is something that is very unsafe and, and that's what I thought of when I was reading this paper is that it goes beyond education. I think it goes to, there may be some instances where you can't send somebody there and think of it as a safe place. And if a, if a site doesn't have a, a non-discrimination policy even, um, is that a safe place for students to go? So I, I like the idea that this is something that is that has to happen at the systems level and, and it has to be considered a safety issue for students. And if I can, sorry, I, I like to add a lot of things, <laughs> um, but I, it just, I identify as a queer person and it's, it's part of um, Kali and I's conversations a lot, the relationship between how we see oppression and in the sense that my experience as a queer person is, is not the same as somebody who is experiencing racism, but it allows me to build coalition with them in understanding a world not built for me, a world that is oppressing me in specific and systematic ways. And so I think that we as practitioners, as a profession, have to see those opportunities for coalition building. We have to see people who are different from us, who maybe don't have the same oppression experience as us, but as allies that we can build bridges across those experiences and understand each other through those lenses in a way that allows us to build relationship and movement to create the change that we're having. That's why we always talk about the intersectionality. That's why we talk about disability and queerness and racism and you know all the things that we talk about in DEI and all of that stuff together because only with all of us together thinking about all those different lenses can we really pull change forward um, in, in that coalition approach. And so I, I just, for those of you who aren't a person of color, if you're white, you know, there are probably ways that society is systemically oppressing you. <laughs> so if anything, it gives you a little bit of a lens into a, a foothold that you can step into this conversation with by connecting it with your own experience of everyday life. I think, yeah, that, I mean, I, I would love to have, you know, a whole, a whole nother meeting, whole other conversation um, about that. I think we could really, um, you know, I think that that is needed. Um, but, you know, like Stacey said earlier, I hate to change the subject or change gears a little bit, but 
Um, you know, in, in the article, you mentioned that um, the percentage of Black um, occupational therapy practitioners has um, decreased over time, and, you know, that's reflected in both academia and, and in practice. Um, do you think that the responsibility of advocacy and implementation of uh, anti-racist anti practices has fallen more heavily to Black or um, other minoritized educators and therapists? And um, if so, is this okay? Are we talking about, you know, adding... Um, you know, more, more burden. I think we've, we've talked a little bit about that, but. Um... Uh, yeah, this is always a tough one <laughs> <laughs> to talk about, right? Uh, the, I think, I, I don't, I don't know if the burden has increased, right? But the burden has always been there. Um, it, the burden has been there to sort of teach about racism and discrimination and oppression um, because as a, a black woman in white spaces, you know, I, I see the things that aren't seen and hear the things that, that are often unheard, right? And um, sort of bringing a, attention to white colleagues uh, about that is a daily occurrence, honestly. Uh, and the other thing is, is when you have such decreased numbers or decreasing, I'm going to talk about it, you know, active tense here, of um, of Black faculty, I will say specifically, and practitioners, the there's the extra burden called the black tax, you know, that you that you take on to mentor not just students in my own program, but you know, students that come to me from like a physical therapy program or speech and hearing, because the 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 black professor is down in OT, right? Or what it happens with our med school students. So the extra burden in that regard, because they don't have any other folks in their uh, their programs that look like them. Uh, consequently, same thing happens out in field work. Hear stories about that all the time as well. It's like if there's a black therapist or um, even a, phys a physiatrist or someone that the students can go to, like they reach out um, to to that person. And so those those burdens are are ongoing and in that regard. Uh, and, and honestly, I feel like there's a little bit of burden that's um, placed on students now as well, um, our black and brown students when they come into field work, uh, particularly for field work ed educators who are also very much interested in this, um, then students end up doing a lot of educating <laughs> on, on field work as well. And, and yeah, you know, the, the learning process is collaborative, um, but the point of field work is not to teach your field work educator about racism, though, you know, <laughs> so really allowing students to experience field work the way that they are meant to um, experience field work has is, is definitely a, a, a thing that I hear about a lot more now than I than I ever have before. Um, kind of going off that, too, I know um, in, I guess, my cohort, we've had a lot of um, discussion about um, you know, how do you, how do you, um, how do organizations or, you know, um, universities um, begin to, you know, kind of reverse that trend and um, like re help recruit and um, retain um, more um, black and under underrepresented um, persons into our profession? Um, do you have, I'm uh, just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, another big one, right? Oh. <laughs> Ryan, were you getting ready to speak on that? Oh, I was just about to say tender soil, um, but you go ahead, Kalia, and I'll, I'll <laughs> say what that means later. <laughs> yeah, no, um, gosh, this this really comes down to for me um, who who we value and who we who do we find worthy of being in particular positions, right? Um, in my position as a professor and. Um, practitioner, I hear all the time that we cannot find Black talent or where are the so-and-sos? Um, do you know people? It's like, we are not hiding is always my response. And so I think uh, our, our institutions, um, that includes our professional institutions as well and associations, have to get out of the weeds of, you know, thinking that, you uh, somehow, although our numbers are few, that we, we cannot be found. You aren't looking for us. And personally, I'm not going to do recruiting for you either. Um, so <laughs> I say all that to say that our, again, our systems have to 
really turn the mirror on themselves to say like, one, do we really want Black faculty? Do we really want Black occupational therapists? Because that's really the question they have to answer. Um, and then once we you know, are able to recruit um, minoritized faculty, minoritized practitioners, are we going to really be intentional about how we change the culture of our institutions to be able to retain them? Because that's always the issue, right? Get them in the door, but then we treat them like crap. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of soul searching, right? That has to happen in institutions to say, you know, who are we and how do we do better about being anti-racist, um, not discriminating, not oppressing all of our minoritized um, work family, right? Because we like to throw that term around too. Uh, so I'll stop there because that, yeah, that that that's one that's that's tender to the soul, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it really. I was. I'm just coming right off of that and saying, tend your soil. I think we so often just. Um, I don't know why I'm almost going biblical here for a second, but you know, like we're throwing seeds out into places they're not going to grow. We're 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 inviting people into spaces that are violent sometimes, or unhelpful, or not really interested in in celebrating the person that they have brought into the faculty, or even as students. And so we have to do a lot of work as a program before you start that recruitment. You should not be finding diverse pictures and plastering your program around just with a bunch of tokenized people of color because you want more recruited students to come to your program unless you have done the work to make sure your program can land those students in a safe and engaging and well-supported program. If you are not there yet, you should not put those pictures up because you're lying. <laughs> you are deceiving the, the recruitment process. And that's that's not okay because we, the, we'll figure it out, you know, as, as soon as they step through the door, if they're not being supported, they will know. And so when you, but I'll also say when you tend your soil, things will start to grow and people will start noticing that your faculty are doing the work. When you have mission statements, when you have active curriculum ch change, when you show that your, your, uh, your faculty are publishing about this sort of topic in their respective fields, people start to notice Kalia starts to notice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and they start finding you often and saying that that looks like you're doing the work. So if you want to get recruitment happening, start doing the work. And I think that that's what most people are, are afraid of, again, because of that fear. Um, so I, I think it's, they're out there, they're not hiding, um, but you need to do the work to make sure that they're willing to come. Thank you, um, Ryan. I think that's a very, very powerful reflection, that notion of tend your soil. I want to expand that a little bit more, and especially now that universities and programs mandated by their systems, their precedents, their departments, their programs, all now have to sort of cultivate this notion of DEI, justice and anti-racism in their programs, in their departments, in their um client facing or stakeholder facing documents, et cetera. I wanna ask, what do you think for those who are just beginning to shift this culture, to change and even sort of remove the bad soil and tend you know, better soil, what is a good starting point to change and make this paradigm shifts? And for those already on their way, what are some critical points that they need to be reminded of regularly to make sure they're really tending their soil? Um, I think that the, the first thing that I would say is that um, practice and motivation are two very important places to start. Um, asking your question of why do we want to do this? Are we doing it because the university is telling us to do this? Or are we doing this because we actively want to take down racism in our society and in the practice of occupational therapy? If it's the latter, that's where we need to be. If it's the former, you're probably not going to do so hot. So then you need to try and get to the latter. Um, and so then from there, practice. I think if, if you are still saying like, oh, I needed a black 
faculty, you know, like that's, you need to be able to say the language. You need to be able to talk about this concept and this idea of anti-racism freely and flowingly, because then you'll be able to get to a place where you can name it and frame it and change it. Um, and so I think people need to practice, you know, it might not be with your, your friends of color. It might be with your other white colleagues, but practice having hard, direct, explicit conversations using language that is clear and direct um, and finding those places within your, your curriculums that it's not being clear and start being clear. Um, so I think it's, it's really practicing the language, but also the conversations and the practices of, of challenging racism when you see it. Um, and so building up those skills across your, your faculty is a really important place to tend your soil. And then I would say, um, well, I'll stop there and let's see, see if Clea has other things to say um, before I go on. Oh, yeah, no, you're good. Um, my mind is actually on, um, you know, as far as tending soil that people sort of think that they have to go outside of their institution to get it. Sometimes you might, but universities um, right now are offering left and right anti-racist pedagogy training um anti-racism and medicine training um and people just need to be conscious about it and, and go out there and be intentional about signing up um and stop treating it like it is this this big foreign scary thing like if we're going to commit to it please jump in head first um and if your university specifically is not offering it y'all it is a easy like quick google search um universities are offering these trainings for free often um, but, but, you know, couldn't agree more with, with, with what Ryan has, um, stated already. And I'll just say in the, the vein of trainings, um, I would be very careful with implicit bias trainings. <laughs> Don't do it. I'll just say it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. See, because direct and real talk to the front conversations here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because our the ahead, literature, already, yeah, the literature <laughs> already tells us that implicit bias training is that doesn't get at the crux of what the problem is. It's not about what is implicit; it's about the explicit behavior that happens, right? You know, people. We talk about critical reflection; like people know what they're doing, right? But they may not understand the 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 harm in which you know it those things um, happen. But um, yes, implicit bias training please skip it. Um, if you haven't heard of it, that's one thing. But most of us at this point um, have been introduced to implicit bias training at some point, but we're really talking about like, how is it that we're going to change the behaviors that emerge and manifest um, and, and harm people in very, very real ways. And implicit bias training does not get at that. So, and I'll, and I'll yeah. stop at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'll just add to answer the second part of your question, um, you know, what are the reminders that we constantly need? And, and that is the work is never done. Um, you're never uh, achieving anti-racism until there's no racism left in the world. That's when we can achieve no racism. But, you know, you're always having to be vigilant. You're always having to grow. You're always having to change and challenge yourself to continue this work. Um, but it's with those actions, it's with actually taking actions and, and looking at your, your actual teaching approach, your, your literature, your syllabi, um, your different activities that you're just demonstrating examples of in class. Um, you know, I think that's where people, we get into habits. Like we, we, all, we all know about routines and habits and we are not immune from those. So to disrupt those every once in a while and as a faculty start um, you know, having check-ins uh, on a on a regular basis, and and saying like, "Hey, what did you do like this year that was different than last year that improved?" Because there's always something. There's always work to be done, um, and that's we can't ever become complacent, or else we're just supporting, um, you know, racism as it stands. I just want to quickly follow up on one very important thing. I think many of us have been to an implicit bias training and, and, and true, it's not it's never really helpful. But on the other end of that spectrum, if we were to attend, choose, or expand on any of the DEI justice and anti-racism trainings out there, what is critical? What is most important sort of soul or component of, of a good DEI justice and anti-racism training? 
Yeah, happy to jump in there. I think one of the most powerful things that I have ever witnessed in any of these trainings um, sort of alludes to what Ryan said about doing audits, right? Really allowing um, or asking participants in these trainings to bring their syllabi, bring your clinical examples, bring like bring these things so that we can untease them and unpack them through an anti-racist lens. Then people really get this analysis of, you know, what it is that, you know, I as an individual am doing or how we as an organization are either contributing and perpetuating it or making sure that we're addressing it and dismantling it. Um, and, you know, not talking about it in abstractions to be like, okay, here is a real example of the things that we are doing now let's analyze it. Um, and I really wish more trainings would do that. And it also provides attendees with tools to take back to their programs. Um, I know at UNC, like we, we, do, we do curriculum audits. You know, we've done equity audits to say, all right, what is it that, not just what we're teaching, but how are we teaching it? You know, are we making our content accessible to our students and, and meet their needs? Um, you know, how, how are we creating equitable spaces for each other as, as educators? And all of that has come from trainings that we have had individually and collectively. Yeah, being able to bring those tools and, and use them in real time. And that's the other thing, you know, in the trainings, give people something that they can take back to their programs. <laughs> you know, I just uh, love that, 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 just love that notion. I just love that notion you just said about audits the, and equity audits, and and I think that that is missing in many critical trainings that we receive. A lot of times, these are just like here are some tools in your toolbox, use it, rather than critically reflecting on what are we doing and where can we really strengthen our efforts on this. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, and the only other thing that I would add that sort of blew my mind uh, when I started this work was the importance of historicizing and understanding the construction of racism as a thing in systems. Um, because I think once you get, we're so far away from the source of racism, like the, the creation of this idea of race that we often, it's like, well, we keep going back and well, where did it start? Where did it start? And once you actually get to where those ideas really started coming from, you start being able to see them a lot easier in the present day. When you understand the rationalization to racialize, um, from the beginning, you can see that rationalization happening now and you're able to call it out better. Um, I think by historicizing and understanding the construction of racism as a thing. Um, and so I think that that's really important in these trainings as well as to not say racism is something that sort of emerges from the person outward, but it's something that has been constructed that sort of um, uh, uh, sort of envelops us and then we sort of move it forward unintentionally often or sometimes intentionally. Thank you guys so much. I feel like we need a part two because I feel like this conversation, can go on. well, maybe you guys need to, to do a part two of your article and then we can have you back and talk more about it. And I know both of you do a lot of other talks. So I, I really do appreciate your time um, today. And I just wanted to open it up to, to both of you um, is there anything else that you would like the listeners to know about the work that you're doing? Or we've already talked about resources a little bit, but any other resources for people who are really interested in this and, and want to do the work and do the growth and, and places you would like to point them? Um, I would just encourage anybody that's listening to this that I, you are engaged in anti-racist, anti-oppression work to, to write about it. Um, let others know like what is working for you, uh, even the mistakes you've made so we don't fall into the same sort of like pitfalls. Uh, but yeah, you know, pro provide us with what is working for your communities. Um, and also consider putting it in places where people can access it for free. Okay, you know, I have to, have to mention that. But yeah, share, share with us um, what you're doing. It's, it's important. <laughs> and I will say, and I don't know that I can emphasize this enough, read outside of the United States. <laughs> mm. Read in journals from Brazil, from Argentina, from Chile, from all, I speak Spanish, so I was, I'm doing the ones that I sort of came first, but you know, we see so much decolonializing work and anti-racism work coming from 
other journals as well as within the United States, but from very different perspectives that we can really learn from. Um, and particularly as we sort of engage in a globalized world with lots of different languages, working to figure out how you're going to access non-English literature. It is not their job to translate for us. It is our job to go find the knowledge that they're bringing to this world in a language we don't understand and learn it. Um, because we have such powerful occupational therapy practitioners and scholars coming from so many different places from the global south that are giving us such wonderful knowledge and implementation tactics for us to use in this work. But we're not seeing them because we are quite, quite isolated sometimes in our professional sort of resources and knowledge. Um, so for the journals out there who are publishing in multiple languages, I applaud them so much um, because I think it is really the place we're at in our globalized world. Um, and, and I think that it's just a wonderful resource for us to take advantage of. Thank you. Uh, Lennon or Isaiah, is there anything you guys want to add before we wrap up? No, I just want to add on to what you just said. We need a part two or part three of this <laughs> conversation. But I think this this has been such a helpful sort of add on to that article, because hopefully when, when this um, uh, recording goes out, that the clinicians, the scholars, the educators, the students will be able to consume many helpful bits of information from this conversation. So I just want to thank you both for this important work. And I just, will say, because I am not above a self-promotion moment, and Kalia knows this, if you like what we said, we do have a podcast together that you can check out. Um, it's called Dr. Thoughts. <laughs> awesome. Well, when we post this, we can we can post a link to the podcast as well. And um, the article will be available open access for free on the AJOT website. Um, so anybody can access it. it. It is only in English. We're not quite there yet, although we have had discussions about making things available in Spanish. Um, but it will be accessible to, um, to everybody. So I hopefully the, they'll hear this, they'll get excited, and then they'll go download your article. Thank, Thank you so much for being for the here. And uh, I really hope that. Uh, that you know you you I know you will continue this work and hopefully you'll come back and talk to us again about all the great things you're doing. Our pleasure. Thank you.